Hello and welcome back. So today I want to do a bit of spice modeling and in particular look at triode vacuum tubes. Now for the most commonly used triode vacuum tubes out there, so your ECC 82, 83, 88, most likely you'll be able to find some sort of model. But what if you want to use a more obscure vacuum tube? For example, the 6S19P single triode vacuum tube. Most likely you won't find any sort of model for this thing. So what I want to do today is look at some of the most common mathematical models out there for vacuum tubes, try to implement them in LT Spice, and finally try out a circuit with this vacuum tube. See how well the simulation can predict what happens in real life. So if you're curious, then keep watching. So how does a vacuum tube work? Well, for the triode you have three elements, the cathode, the grid and the anode, and when you heat up the cathode it starts to glow, it emits electrons, and these electrons will move from the cathode to the anode under the action of an electrical field, which is caused by the voltage difference between the cathode and the anode, and you can control this electron flux using the grid based on what potential the grid is at. So the more negative the grid is in reference to the cathode, the more it will repel the electrons that are trying to come from the cathode, and thus it will control the current flowing through the vacuum tube. So we can say that the anode current is proportional to the grid to cathode voltage times the transconductance of the vacuum tube, its current to voltage ratio. Now this is a very simple way of looking at it, but in real life things are a bit more complicated. First of all you need to take into account the anode to cathode voltage and you need to consider that the dependencies are not perfectly linear. Now there are a lot of books out there on how vacuum tubes work, but one of the earliest papers that handles how to model the vacuum tube operation in a spice simulator is this one. So this is a paper written by Mr. Marshall Leach, hope I'm pronouncing that right, and it goes over the basic model, what it needs to look like. So you will have the three electrodes, the plate or the anode, the grid and the cathode. There's a current sink between the anode and the cathode, inter-electrode capacitors, so these are usually already defined in the datasheet. And there's one more important element, which is this thing, a resistor and a diode between the grid and the cathode. This is here to signify that if, for whatever reason, you drive the grid positive, in reference to the cathode, certain current amount will flow through there. So the paper goes on to explain how to link the anode current to the grid to cathode voltage and the anode to cathode voltage. The basic formula behind it looks something like this. And if we try to implement this in a spice simulation, it's gonna look similar to this. So what I have here is the basic model. So I have the three electrodes, anode, grid, cathode, the capacitors, the grid to cathode diode, which has the resistor built into it, and then my current sink. And the formula behind the current sink, it, it's a behavioral current source in this case, is the one from the paper. And then I have all my parameters here on the left side, so I have my capacitances, this K and the transconductance parameter, and then a few parameters for the diode. And to test this thing, I have this little setup here, which will provide grid voltages going from 0 to minus 5 in 0.5 volt increments. And then I'm supplying an anode voltage that goes from 0 to 500 volts, and it rises in a second. Basically, I get something like this. And of course, we can plot on the x-axis the anode voltage. And if we rescale things a bit, it looks something like this. So what I have here is the average anode currents for various grid voltages. So the first graph is for zero grid voltage, the last one is for minus five volts. So now if we compare this graph to what we could find in an actual datasheet, so we have the 12 AX7 datasheet in the background, and the parameters used in the model are for the 12 AX vacuum tube from the paper, we can see a few problems. 
So first of all, the graph sort of looks right and sort of doesn't at the same time. Main problem being that in the actual vacuum tube, most of the curves are concave, so they have a bend inwards, but the one at zero volts is convex, it has a bend outwards, whereas in the simulation all of the graphs are concave. And the other issue we have with the model is that you can run the grid to positive voltages, and this in real life will generate a curve that's even more convex, but always starting from zero. Whereas in the model, if I run positive grid voltages, I get a somewhat different result. We see anode currents starting at zero anode voltage at a certain value. So this isn't really right. So the point is that although this model is fairly decent, it's not good enough. But there are more complex and more accurate models out there. And the one that I've seen being referenced over and over in any sort of paper that handles vacuum tube modeling is the one made by Mr. Norman Corrin. So you can read about this on his website. There's a lot of details here, both for triode modeling and for pentode modeling. But to skip most of the details, this is what the final mathematical model looks like. As you can see, it's pretty big. Now I highlighted with red the variables, so there's two, the grid to cathode voltage and the anode to cathode voltage, and I highlighted in blue the constants. And there's like five of them. So it's a pretty complicated model. Let's see just how well it works. So what I prepared here is the same spice circuit that we had before, so nothing changed other than the equation in the current source. The only thing I did to simplify things is add this extra behavioral voltage source so that I don't have a very very long equation, it's broken up into two pieces. And if we run this thing, again I'm using the parameters for the 12AX7 from the website, and we just adjust the graph a bit, and well it's still not perfect, we still have these curves that are always convex, we don't have this concave one, but if we try out positive grid voltages, so rather than going from 0 to minus 5, I go from 2 volts to minus 5, and we re-simulate. So now all of them start from 0, which is a very good sign, so that's how they're supposed to. But we can also see that we have some of these graphs going convex. So it goes from a convex graph slowly to a concave graph. And this is exactly what we want, because this is what happens in real life. So the graph looks just like it does in the datasheet, it just has an offset. So rather than having this curve at a grid bias of 0 volts, we have it at a grid bias of 0 0.5 volts. So we can fix this by adding an extra constant. So I did see this being attributed to Mr. Norman Corrin in some other research papers, maybe his website isn't updated. Basically by adding this extra constant we can create an offset in the grid voltage so that the simulation will match the datasheet. So this is the final model, it's the exact same thing, I just added this grid to cathode constant, and if we add this, well, our graph looks perfect really. So we have our first zero volt on the grid going convex, and then everything is concave at a slope that's ever increasing. So the main reason why everybody keeps coming back to this mathematical model is that, well, it's really the best. This is a model that can almost exactly replicate how the tube works in real life. So you can almost perfectly match what you can find in a datasheet. The only problem now is, where do you get all your six constants from? I mean, none of these are in the datasheet. Maybe your transconductance is there, but you might end up using a different value altogether, so how do you figure out these constants for another vacuum tube? Well, you can find various programs out there. Some of them are based on mathematics programs, others not. But what I found was that with a bit of trial and error, you can get the job done pretty well. So what I got here is a spreadsheet program in which I implemented the formula, so the mathematical model. And based on the input parameters of the formula, I'm generating the graphs corresponding to the various grid voltages. So here I'm inserting my anode voltage going from zero to whatever high voltage. 
and then I have various grid voltages at which I want to generate my curve. And basically what I did here was overlap the graph made by the spreadsheet with an extract from the datasheet. Point is that if both graphs have the same scale, so the same anode voltage and the same anode current, if you get the lines to match up, then you have a good model. And basically by playing around with the various elements of the model, you can get the graph more or less to match what's in the datasheet. So it's not perfect, but it's a good enough match. So I got here a few sets of data that are more or less close to the end result, but I found that this set is the one that best suits the behavior of the vacuum tube. Now, when you're playing around with the values to try to figure out how to get the model to work right, it's important to know what each of the values does. So all of them have an influence on the final graph, but each of them will have slightly different influence on what the graph looks like. So I wrote some hints here about what each of the values mean and well, I'll leave this in the description so you can play around with it and see what happens. And to test out the model, I will build this basic circuit. So here on the right side, I have the library made. So I have the basic schematic for the library based on the schematic that we've just seen. And for this particular tube, I inserted the parameters generated with the spreadsheet. So of course the capacitances are from the datasheet directly. Then I have my parameters and finally this grid cathode resistor. While you don't really have any information about this in the datasheet, this represents how much current the grid will be drawing when it turns positive. So one, two kilo ohms can be left as a default value or you can measure it. So the circuit that I will be testing is a very basic series voltage regulator that uses a gas discharge tube as a reference, so the STR85. I took its parameters from its datasheet, so for this you already have a model built into LDSpice. And for the triode, under MISC you already have a triode symbol, so you don't have to bother with making a symbol for this. So if we run this thing, my input voltage goes from 100 to 300 back down to 100. And if we look at the output, well, it's not a perfectly stable output. That's because of just how simply the circuit was built. For a proper voltage regulator, you'll need probably an extra vacuum tube. But we can see here at around 120, 530 volts input voltage when the gas discharge tube switches on and then we have the output voltage. So now I will build the circuit in real life and look at the output at a few input voltages and see just how well the two match up. So the simulation with reality. And this is the circuit that I've built. I'll be using my high voltage power supply, supplying the circuit and then I'll be measuring the output with a voltmeter. So if we fire this thing up, I'm supplying it with 130 volts at the moment and we just need to wait for the tube to heat up. So for the output to increase in voltage a bit. So circuit seems to be stable. So I guess the filament has heated up. Now I'm not sure how much you can see with all this light in the room, but I did make this picture when there was no light and there you can see just how pretty the tubes are glowing. Tubes are not efficient, but they are pretty. So now if we play around with the voltage a bit, so my power supply can go up to 284 volts. At this point, my output is 133. And then if I start decreasing the voltage, so at 251, it's 124. And the lower I go, the lower the output. So you can see that the voltage stabilizer isn't that good at stabilizing. But that was never the point. The point was to see just how well the values measured in reality match up with the values measured in the simulator. <sighs> well, it's not perfectly accurate, but it's only about 10% off. So considering vacuum tube manufacturing tolerances, it's pretty okay. Now, if you have a curve tracer, which is a piece of hardware that can generate the exact curves for your particular vacuum tube, then you can get the model to be far more accurate. So you can adapt your parameters based on the exact tubes you have. But even so, this model and this approach is good enough to 
build a circuit in a simulator and see exactly how it should work. So to see what you're supposed to be looking for and what you're supposed to be getting from the physical circuit. But that will be all for today. So hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.